Uh, San Sebastian is, is um, probably the worst place you could ever be sent. It, the prison has been condemned by four different judges and uh, the, the capacity was 600, there was 1300 when I was in there. Now you're going to read in the book, I go into great detail of some of the circumstances, the amount of people in the jail, all of this is I've, I've documented in the book. All I can say is there was a lot of guys in there that didn't belong in there, myself being one of them. There, they have a, a system where you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. So the idea is the prosecutor accuses you of something and then they put you in jail. And then a couple of months later, you'll have a hearing, but you've already spent two months in jail. And also in San Sebastian, when you're, when you're held in there, you don't have any real contact with the outside. You've got uh, three five minute phone calls that are interrupted three different times by recordings reminding the person that they're being recorded and they're talking to a prisoner. If you wanted to make a local call before that person answers the phone, it's going to say you're receiving a call from the prison and it's uh, going to be recorded. And a lot of people, when I was really looking for help, just wouldn't answer the phone. People didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to get associated. Um, it was, you were, you were locked into a situation where you had no way of defending yourself. Now you had your attorney, which you eventually got, but your attorney is so busy, they don't come to visit you, you don't have anybody to talk to. Um, you're really trying to figure this whole thing out. Why am I in jail? Why is this happening? And, and that was the hardest part about it, is you just didn't get any answers. The conditions, I covered the conditions a lot in the book. The conditions were deplorable. I mean, anybody that went and went in and took a tour of this place or had experienced it, they'd say, how can this happen? But that's the way it is there, and that's just the way the way they do things. Now the problem with me being in San Sebastian is they have a prison for 60 and over, which obviously I was. They wanted to keep me in this prison, and I believe they wanted to make it as miserable as possible on me, and eventually get me to break down and cave in and admit some type of guilt. Okay, I went to the administrator of the prison, and he said, no, you can't uh, go to the 60 and over prison until you've been sentenced. My lawyer, who really was a good lawyer, but not good at this type of uh, situation, really didn't know. And he said, yeah, I understand that's the way it is without researching it. So I, they continued to keep me there when I wasn't supposed to be there. It wasn't until after I was in maybe five months when a social worker came to me and says, that's a lie. And I, and, I, and I cover this a lot in the book as the procedure of trying to get out of this prison and get to this 60 and over prison. Because in San Sebastian, you're locked up. You're in a cell with you know, 25, 30 guys at a time. They lock you down. They, you're, you're supposed to go outside, but a lot of times they don't let you out. The cells were enough. They stacked the beds three high and you had enough to squeeze through. So there was no like maneuverability room, there was no, no table set up in there. You were crammed in there, chairs were not allowed, and you had buckets, a plastic bucket to sit on. So if you couldn't lay in your bed and say the TV, see the TV, you sat on a bucket. A lot of guys moved into the bathroom, which had one stall, and they would play chess or do their drugs or whatever they did in there, and that was crowded. So there was no, it was claustrophobia beyond belief. Well, how about sleeping? Uh, when you first got there? When I first got there, seeing that the prison was so overcrowded, there obviously wasn't enough beds for the prisoners. So they just, you got a two inch rubber mat, throw it on the floor, and there's where you slept was on the floor. You had no uh, maneuverability whatsoever. Someone wanted to get into their uh, cabinet next to you, they just opened it up right in you. Someone would step, crawl out of bed, they'd step right on you. I had never been in this situation before, and the claustrophobia is what was the worst. So in the night, I would crawl towards the bathroom, and in the bathroom there was a little bit of room, and then it was right by the bars, and I'd be able to stick my face next to the bars to feel a little bit of air coming in and not feel this closing in on you. It was a horrible situation, and then during the day, 
there was no place to sit down, no place to rest. A lot of these guys went and laid down, read in their bed. I had guys that would say, hey, Dave, you know, I'll go lay in my bed for a while or something, just relax. I mean, that would happen. But it wasn't until five weeks later that I had an opportunity to get a bed. And the way you get a bed, it's all a bribe. You have to pay the guy who's in charge of the, the cell block, the guy who's in charge of your cell. You could pay up to $300 for a bed. And then you pay the money to the guy, and then they maneuver people around. And there's guys that gave up their beds for the money, or for their take of the money. So it was about five weeks into it where I finally got a bed. It was on the top bunk, and I believe me, it was hard to get up and hard to get down. And you're nervous at night, you got to go to the bathroom. It wasn't a very good situation, but it was better than sleeping on the floor. I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the biggest breaks I had was after I was in for about two or three months, Ronald came down to me and said, hey, we got a new prisoner today. He's a Canadian. My first thought was, does he speak English? Yes, he speaks English. He's, he, he, he's heard of you and he wants to talk to you. Well, the next thing you know, here's Jason, who is an absolute genius. He's a computer whiz. He, he operates his own company. He owns an office building. You're saying, what is this guy doing in here? Well, he was indicted on some type of wire fraud or another guy rolled over on him. It's a long story, but he was waiting to be extradited. And here's one of the things that the system has wrong. Jason has a nice house, he has a nice family, he's not a flight risk, anything like that. But they kept him in prison. And it was so stupid because it, it was breaking up his family, it was doing everything, and he had a hard time with it. So him and I became very close and we talked about everything. And Jason was a, was a tough guy. He looked like a nerd. And he looked like he, he grew up on a computer. But don't mess with him. And he would get in the face of anybody. He had a real edge to him. And I had to like say Jason settled down several times. But he became a very close friend. And at night, you're so crowded in, and they turn the lights out at 8 o'clock, him and I sometimes would sit in the corner. And his family brought him food. And, treats and everything and of course I didn't have anything so he'd always hear have some of my cookies have some of my cake whatever just really became a, a close friend and a lot of it was I think I helped him out too because he needed someone to talk to and eventually his best friend outside of the visit was Diego who eventually became my lawyer so if it wasn't for Jason I don't think I'd ever met Diego and who knows what would have happened but Jason was a big part of the thing so you finally got transferred. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because when the social worker told me I'll have you out of here in a couple of weeks, after all of the disappointments I've had, I'm sitting there going, yeah, right, I don't believe anything anybody says. And I'm out in the yard one day and I'm walking around with a former police policeman, uh, Costa Rican policeman who spoke a little bit of English and we're talking and all of a sudden one of the guards comes up and hands me a piece of paper in Spanish. This policeman takes a look at it and he goes, congratulations, Dave, you're being transferred to the 60 and over prison. It was shock. I was so happy. 